Okay. All right. So um, we were talking about the um, elements of a Christian counselor. We looked through three points. We said a Christian counselor needs to be spiritually mature. We need to be grounded in the scripture. We need to be prayerful. <clears throat> the next point that we're looking at in is uh, we need to be a giver of hope, of being able to offer uh, the hope that a lot of people lose. So, uh, you know, majority of people who come into for counseling have given up hope. You will find that, you know, uh, they, they come in with extremely deep heartaches and many have had very shattering life experiences. It could be either through the death of a loved one. It can be because of a loss of a job. It can be because of a divorce or some or, a, or, a, or an abuse or something that's happened um, or maybe over years of time and they've come to that place of hopelessness. You know, others may have failed over and over a period of time and they have and, and they need that hope. So some may have had their hopes, you know, broken down repeatedly and have given up. And that could be the desperate condition by which people come in. So the need of hope and its role uh, in counseling, you know, can can never be overemphasized because if, when you look at you know the 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 word of God and uh, you know some of the scripture brings about how hope produces confidence. You know, when when we have when when we have our hope in God, when God is the one who instills in us that hope, it produces confidence. Hope is something that produces joy that even can come even through the most difficult times. The joy that remains even when things are difficult, difficult, or hope is something that helps us to bring about perseverance, or hope is something that helps us build greater faith and greater love. Hope is something that helps us to bring about uh, a consistency. You know, it, it helps us, gives us a new lease of life and energy and an enthusiasm, right? So hope is something that, that builds us, that brings about that stability. And we know our ultimate source of hope. Our ultimate source of hope is the Lord Jesus and what he did for us and what we are going to receive alongside with him. And if that's something in whatever way we can instill in them the hope that the Lord is the one who leads us through all of this, you know, I think a lot of our uh, interactions with counselees are so much more peaceful and so much more, um, I, I'd like to use the word successful, because they have a sense of hope. A lot of times with the problems they come with, they feel so hopeless that even even talking to a counselor becomes uh, you know a, a, a big issue but that's what that's what we need to encourage um, people with to to have to be in a place where they can be built up in that sense of hope what are additional additional things when we are in uh, working with people um, listening and Hearing is an important part of counseling, okay? It is a very important part of counseling, but that's not enough. They need to be moved to the next stage of taking action, of building themselves up into something as a change. So as a counselor, I need to activate change. There needs to be a catalyst that makes them want to change, okay? So that change does not happen if I'm advising. If I tell Susan, as we were talking about, Susan, you cannot have second thoughts of your marriage, you need to work on your marriage. Now, if I need to activate change by helping her feel motivated towards that change. Now, that's the process and that's what this entire course is about, how are we going to do that? But our, our, our Outcome always is that when, when a counselee comes to you in, let's say, at A, how can they move from A to B or A to C? That's what we want them to be, not continue to keep them at the same place that they are in. Maybe their circumstances may not change as much, but the way that they interact with their problem or their circumstances may change. So we need to be that activator of change. And that's an outcome that we look to as we go in through counseling. And, and a lot of this will become clear as we move through the um, 
through the course. Okay. Next is to motivate practice of scriptures at problem areas. So uh, helping our counselee to walk alongside with what scripture teaches or being in obedience with what scriptures. Now remember, the word is motivate, not to, um, not to push down. Okay, so there is a very different difference in the way when you motivate and when you put down, put it down somebody's throat. When you put it down somebody's throat, it is going to be seen in absolute rebellion. But when you're motivating them to practice whatever the word says in their areas of problem, all right? And being patient, being patient even as they make those mistakes or take a while to get there, being patient. Next one is being compassionate. Now, that the, in, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus, this is one uh, trait or characteristic feature that we see of Jesus that uh, that runs through all of his dealings with people, right? You, you see that he was compassionate to them. He saw them and his heart was filled with compassion, right? So that is the same um, uh, way we need to, to be at, this, the position or the posture we need to be at in order to deal with people. So being compassionate, knowing that they, there are struggles and being compassionate to work with them through that. And of course, to use wisdom, to use um, the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about that wisdom. Okay. Uh, I, we're going to move on to the specific principles of counseling. Now, there are seven principles of counseling. When we look at these principles, um, you know, th these are uh, um, these are, are things that we apply uh, in our interaction with the counseling. So remember, like I said, the relationship becomes um, becomes the medium where there are going to be changes in the person or in the situation of the of the counselee. And this relationship uh, has certain dynamics to it that help to build a better result for your counselee. It helps them to adjust better. It helps them to bring about change. So these principles are mainly some attitudes of the counselor or some uh, perspectives of the counselor that we need to work through as we are dealing with the with the counseling. All right. So the, uh, the relationship between the counselor and the counselee usually is a lot more stronger when a counselor works through some of these principles. And there are seven principles that I want to bring bring up and uh, we will take each one of them one by one. So I have certain examples for each of them so that you know we understand exactly um, what is it uh, these principles mean. Okay, so for the first principle, I'll, I'll bring about the um, uh, a case and then you know you could we, we could think about how we would we would work so this is a case there is a young couple who has just had a newborn baby and they realize that the child is physically challenged the husband being physically challenged himself is quite calm and composed and acceptant of the reality of the of the child being disabled or challenged physically challenged whereas the wife is troubled and very distressed at the thought of a differentially, sorry, at the thought of a differentially able child. Okay, um, how would you? Uh, what would you? What would be the first thing that you would tell this young mother? What What is it that you will tell her, or you would listen to her? You would encourage her. What would you? What would you say? Remember interaction. Okay, let's participate so that. Our learning is much better. So what would you tell this, this mother? Are you all in the call? Yes, we are. Okay, 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 okay. All right, yeah, okay. Okay, Subhashish, so you'd say God is the creator, okay? Yeah, uh... 
it's a very difficult situation uh, so i don't think uh, she can be consoled by anything that i can mm -hmm. see yeah mm -hmm. okay so what would you do just be by the person side yeah just be by them okay yeah. okay just be by them showing your support and uh, understanding yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah. all right wonderful anyone else has any other response or thought uh i think uh, we can stay by her side and we can also tell her uh, how happy she will be when she gets the child you i mean obviously it's her child <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. not very mm -hmm. sure about how I can console, but uh, mm -hmm. we can maybe ch help her change her perspective. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, Lubega, go ahead. Having been uh, an administrator for almost 15 years, I have come across people who have kids like that. But one time, one of them told me what I thought was the best answer. She told me, number one, we need to show her that uh, this is God's will. There is nothing we can do about it. And the rest is to keep quiet about it. We, know we don't advise anything because whatever we speak is really disturbing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. So the reason why I bought this... Um, uh, you know, this this case up is uh, often, especially when you see, uh, the, uh, here you'd see the husband ha is quite calm and composed, very acceptant of it, whereas the wife finds it troubling, right? And there may be times that uh, we tend to push somebody to react in a way that, uh, uh, as an example, you know, you're comparing two people and saying, look at the way the husband has reacted. Maybe, you know, you should take on that reaction. See, you know, he's very positively taking it. Look at the way he's doing it, you know, and uh, be encouraged by that. And I think that's something we've got to be extremely careful about. And, and that's where this principle comes about. The principle is called individualization. Okay. So, what does this principle mean? It is the right that people can be people. They have feelings, they have thoughts, they have thinking, the way that they think about something is they are they are doing so because they, they've come with whatever background that they are. So there isn't any judgment placed on them as people. We accept their right to be who they are. Okay, and that's uh, that's important in in counseling because it helps a counselee. I'm uh, sorry, it helps a counselor to uh, not analyze an individual from an aspect. Okay, but knowing and understanding that every individual is different from others, and they are extremely unique in the way that they are made. So you recognize and understand that everyone have unique aspects or unique qualities or unique ways of thinking. And they can't be compared to anybody else. So, you know, when, you, when, when you're dealing with them, when you're helping them, your mode of helping must be in accordance to where they are at, right? Not that you want them to change from this place into another place so then you can work alongside them so when you're helping them when you are working alongside them you accept accept them for the place and the uh, uh, the, the status that they are in okay so you as a counselor you may need to use different methods to help this person undergo that change it may not be in accordance to the way that you have maybe learned it or the way that you generally see people. It may not be that. There may be a, a different way in t learning or helping them towards or assisting them towards that change. Okay. So each individual person is treated as an entity, as a, as a completely new design. 
and um, you know just like uh, this is this is so scriptural like you know god made each one of us in his image and he made all of us very different he made of all of us very unique and the way that god deals with me may not be the way that he deals with you right of course there are, there are uh, whole truths that are there we, we're all um, uh, seen by the same standards but the way that he relates to me is maybe very different from the way that he relates to a friend of mine so the principle of individualization is to ensure that they are seen as people with uniqueness with unique strengths with unique problems with unique ways of working through so every person is seen like you know a new new package of different things so that the principle of individualization is extremely important as we work with them so yeah it, it is the right to be treated as a person with personal differences so that's what the principle of individualization is okay we'll go on to the second principle um, the second principle there are two scenarios i've written here so the first uh, scenario is a young wife has lost her husband to sudden death she comes to you and cannot control her tears and her emotions and is incessantly crying or a man is sharing and says, I'm so depressed, I can't work, I can't think, I just sit there all day. What state of mind do you think these um, counselees are in? What state of mind do you think these counselees are in? Yes. Uh, I don't I'm know so how sorry. to put it into words. <laughs> Actually, I think <laughs> uh, I think the first one uh, she must be very depressed. I think she's lost in her mind. Uh, okay. And I think the second one is maybe confused about things, maybe unstable. Okay. All right. So when so when you are okay, I think the way you said stuck out of any way to go forward. Okay, so just basically so hopeless and so stuck, right? Now, when someone's talking to you in in a state like this, the tendency often can be that that you feel just as bogged down as they are, right? Or um, maybe maybe to a point that um, uh, they're so distressed that you feel or you sense that you know something has to be done immediately when someone is crying or feeling extremely hopeless. It's like this, you know, when your child has a fall and they're crying, you hurt so much that you want them to stop crying, and if they stop crying, that means everything is okay, right? And this can be the case that we may see when someone's come and very upset. We are sometimes so uncomfortable that they are expressing such deep, sorrowful, miserable emotions that often we feel we must just move them forward to a place of getting okay. Uh, do you understand what I mean? Are you with me? Yes. yes yeah okay yeah. so it's it's that desire or that feeling that hey someone is so emotionally broken i need to fix their emotions as soon as possible okay that's the tendency that we may have now this is what the 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 next principle is it is a purposeful expression of feelings so what does this mean it's first and foremost that to help and to recognize and allow the counselee to express their feelings freely. They, uh, we should be giving them a space where they're given the opportunity to not really hold back, but to be able to express anything that they are feeling. So think of this like this. You know, if you have a soda bottle or a, or, a, or a Pepsi or a Coke bottle, you shake it and you 
you close it, do you, do you see the fizz that's inside? The minute that you open it, everything wants to come up. And sometimes what do we do? We try and close it again so that it doesn't come up. Now, that's what, as a counselor, we've got to be careful to do, to, not to do, to close the lid on, the, on, on feelings that are being expressed, right? Uh, they need to be able to be in a place where they can express their feelings absolutely freely. So in order for them to do that, we as counselors need to listen purposefully. So it is as they are expressing their feelings, we are listening rather than closing the lid on their emotions and not permitting them to talk. We allow them to 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 talk so that uh, and, and our listening facilitates that. So as a counselor, you're not discouraging or condemning any of the, those expressions like think about Susan. OK, so Susan said, I have second thoughts about this marriage. She would have come up with such courage to tell you a pastor or a or a Christian leader about what she's going through. Right. And I don't want to be in a place to discourage what she's to disc, to make her discuss what she's feeling. Rather, I would like that she dis, this uh, uh, discloses that. Now, remember, all because she is expressing something negatively uh, and and we are in a place of listening does not mean that you are accepting of what she is proposing to do okay so i think that's what generally becomes a difficulty we feel that if i don't put a stop this to this negative feeling of hers then i am not then i am allowing her or permitting her to think that i'm okay with what she's saying all right but that's not the case all because you are listening carefully you are acknowledging her feeling of of, uh, of having these thoughts does not mean that you acknowledge her action or acknowledge her behavior so you as a counselor need to ensure that you're, you're not condemning or discouraging those th those thoughts or those feelings uh, in other words you need to help to stimulate it bring it up in such a way that you help the uh, the counselee to be able to share everything that is there with it and that's that's effective why because the counselee themselves are able to uh, explore what is really going on within them. Unless a person gets in tune with what they are feeling, unless they are in tune with the negativities of their feelings, there isn't going to be a place of understanding. So to explore that feeling is, is important. And one way of doing that is to help them to express what they are going through, OK? Is that clear? Can I go on to the next principle? Yes, ma'am. OK. Are we clear? Are we all in this with me? I'm not getting too much of a response. I'm a little worried if everyone is in line or uh, half of us are sleeping. Is this working? Is this interesting? OK, get some yeses. OK, thank you. Thank you. All right. OK, so. Uh, we'll move on to the next principle. The next principle, uh, let me bring about an example, okay? Uh, you have been called to see a man in the hospital. Before you go in to see him, you find out through talking to the doctor that the man is terminally ill. You go into the room and the man says to you, I want to ask you something. Am I going to die? Do you know? Can you tell me? Am I going to die? Okay. What would your response be? I know this is a really difficult one too. But what would your response be? I'm not putting anybody at the spot, okay? It's just getting your thing to yourselves to think. Uh, we'll ask him to calm down. <laughs> Sorry? And then we'll say, uh, we'll just yeah. ask him to calm down and we'll just say, you're going to be all right. I mean, I think most of the time when I see sick people, we say, you're going to be all right, get well soon. 
<laughs> that's the only okay. thing we say right? <laughs> okay okay yeah. all right so adivya says uh, i am uh, i think the adivya said tell okay someone said tell him he's not going to die divya says i am happy that i could meet you today okay uh, subhasha says no i won't die lobeka yes what would you say i will i, I it's not easy to tell this person that he's going to die <laughs> <laughs> but if it were me in in, the, in those shoes i would say that life and death is in the hands of god so let's pray about it about if you're going to die or not i'm not certain i'm not sure okay all right okay all right Th- thank you i mean lovely answers i'm so glad that you're la you know you're la putting yourself in that position to think all right so uh, the the point over here is i think i need you to see um what is behind those questions okay he's maybe probably what is he doing those these are questions that are reflecting reflective questions you know am i really going to die do you know um you know can you tell me is this going to be the end so when you hear a question like that immediately think about what is the significant emotion that this person is going through maybe this fear or maybe there is a a sort of um, doubt or there is whatever whatever the condition is or whatever his situation is okay maybe there is um, uncertainty right maybe there's there are so many emotions that are going through so something something i would do here is you know uh, i i'm i'm sure you really would like to know this and i i do see that it can be terrifying to be in a place like you are you know it's it's not certain you don't know what's going to happen it can be very fearful even if i were you in, in your place you know i can't imagine the kind of emotions you're going through right so what uh, what are we doing here is basically what we saying is your in- involvement emotionally with your counselee is controlled now if i were to tell him hey yeah you know the doctor said this and sorry you have only one week you're going to die right i am being very insensitive to the counselee's feelings or if i were to say no 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 you won't die no absolutely not you know take away that that thought from from your mind whereas inside you're actually wondering oh god you know please you you you're probably feeling a sense of uh, um uncertainty yourself so it's important to be sensitive to what someone's going through maybe yes half the time you won't have any of the answers but but being controlled in your involvement emotionally is not going to help him at any way if you're going to sit down with him and cry with him it's not going to help or you're going to say hey, forget about all of this let's just laugh a little bit that's not going to help either right now he's in a place of confusion he's in a place of fear he's in a place of absolute frustration and knowing that and being able to reflect it so so it's important to be sensitive and make an effort to understand what they are trying to say rather than getting involved in that emotional rut with them right like for example some counselees when they're talking to you can really express their anger to you that even you feel so angry you know yeah you're right you know let's go to the police and let's go give a complaint you kind of get involved in that with them and that's what as a counselor you've got to be careful about not being overly controlled by your own emotions because of what your counselee is going through so you are being purposeful and using those emotions appropriately now you are appropriately responding to the emotions of your counselee because let's say when someone is really agitated you get even more agitated alongside with them you're not helping them to rationalize and think about a solution what you need to do is to engage with them in their emotions bring them to a place of reasoning 
So as a counselor, we need to ensure that we are controlled in the way and we look at the problem of the counselee with objectivity, as if how are they looking at it, okay? And being able to respond in a way that controls your involvement in that entire process, okay? The, uh, now, this happens, this, um, the, this control emotional involvement, what you're doing is you are seeing them as a person more than getting into their problems and helping them work through it in a way that's more controlled. So you're actually being an example in the way of how you deal with that. So sometimes it's a reality, like, like we were talking about in this example, maybe there's a lot of fear. So stating them back, yes, it, it appears like a very uncertain, fearful um, thing to not know what is going to happen, isn't it? Right? And they say, yes, I feel I feel very broken. I didn't expect. Uh, you will hear them begin to bring about that. And that's what you are looking for, for them to be able to release what is happening over them emotionally. Okay? I hope uh, that makes sense. Yes? Can I move on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, the next principle, and let's look at an example. A young woman comes to talk to you about God and his existence. She feels that she can't break away her allegiance to her God, but yet would also like to treat Jesus as one of the many gods. Now, this is an example you will hear. I mean, you this, this you will hear everywhere, right? So as a counselor, what is my stand? And here's the principle. This principle is called a self-determination. What does this mean? That is, every individual has the right to make their own choices and decisions. They have the freedom to make their own choices and decisions. So what you are doing, what you understand is the counselee may have, may be in a certain position with a certain need, and they need to have the freedom or given the choice to make their decisions and choices. Why is this so important in counseling? Is because tomorrow they won't, they, they will turn around and say, I did this because you told me to. And that's something I don't think we need to hear or we need to be in a position uh, or a place to be in, that I have taken the decision for my counseling. They are the ones who make whatever choice that they have. So what are you doing? You're actually respecting their right to make the choice. If you look at the way Jesus, uh, you know, has treated um, or in his ministry, there was always a choice that people had. If you look at the rich ruler, right? He made his choice. Did Jesus tie him around the noose and pull him back? Say, no, no, you have to do it. No, he was given the respect and the right to choose their own decision, okay? So that means as a counselor, I am going to keep away from any form of interference in the choices that they make. Yes, it is up to me as a counselor to help my counselee think about the choices they're making, about the pros and the cons of the choices they're making, but I give them the complete freedom to do so. I give them the complete freedom to make that choice. So that's what self-determination means. The ability and the right and the freedom that you give to the counselee to make their own choices and decisions, okay? The next one is, uh, this is an example. I mean, this is, this is a case again. A husband is talking to you and says, you know, I've got all this guilt. Every time I sleep with this other woman, I feel so guilty. What can I do about it? So this is a, a, a husband who has been probably having an extramarital affair, comes to you and is, you know, talking about uh, being in sin, feeling guilty, but saying what uh, he doesn't know what he can do about it. Now, this is, this is a very simple answer, right, for a believer. Okay, you're guilty. You know you're in sin. Get away. That's it. Right? Don't do this. This is wrong. Get away. Okay. Here's the principle. This is the principle of acceptance. What is the principle of acceptance? It is the recognition that every person 
is um, one worth dignity, one worth um, value, okay? Regardless of their problem, regardless of their personal qualities, regardless of their environment or the things that they're doing, we accept the person as they are. We accept the individual or the person. We love and have compassion for the individual as they are and make no forms of judgment on that. So it acceptance does not mean that you are approving of their behavior. But now this, this case, it does not mean that you've approved of what he's doing or approved of his standards or, or whatever he's, he's up to. It doesn't mean that. This acceptance, the principle of acceptance is regardless of whatever they are coming to you, you accept them as a person. You accept them as one made in the Lord's image, the one who the Lord loves, the one who is inherently um, beautiful and fearfully made by God. I, I treat them and accept them as people and not with regard to their um, behavior or their actions. Okay. Now, acceptance also includes thought and feeling elements. And so what does that mean? The way that I think about somebody will definitely manifest in the way that I treat them. If I think about him, okay, he's a sinner, you know, he's somebody who is, uh, uh, who's been uh, unfaithful to his wife. So if I continue to make judgments in my mind about the person, it will be ex it will be expressed that way. But if I were to look at him and say, okay, he's come with a problem, but nevertheless, he's a man who God's created, or he's someone God loves, and I and and so you will see the manifest um, result to be similar. So acceptance not just includes. Um, the way that you talk to them, but even in the way that you you think about them, the way that you feel about the person, that's what acceptance also uh, encompasses. Okay, we'll move on to the last two. Um, here's an example for the next principle. A wife in counseling says, I just separated from my husband. I'm emotionally involved with another man. I'm not sure that my husband and I can work it out. I know what my beliefs are but I'm not sure what to do, okay? Here we've come to the place of the principle of a non-judgmental attitude. Now, this is based on the very aspect that um, every counseling process should not have assigning guilt or innocence, you know? We've got to be very careful that we don't assign guilt to somebody, or we don't assign innocence to somebody. Oh, yeah, you, you've done the right thing, or you know, you've done the wrong thing. That is something that we need to be careful, being careful not to judge, not to judge others. Okay. And how does what does that include? Judging includes making statements about uh, their attitudes, their actions, or their standards. Being careful not to be in that position of being of uh, of making those statements. Like you know, as as Jesus has written, first look at the log in your eye before you can take out the speck in the other person's eye. Okay, so being careful to to meet with them with a non-judgmental attitude, with an attitude of acceptance. Okay. Uh, next one, a teenager comes in to see you. He sits down and says, I hate my parents. They stink and I don't care what happens to them. Okay. Um, all right. Now, often when something like this happens with the teenager, um, you know, and you are meeting with the parents, sometimes you may go and say, you know, your teenager doesn't really like you. They think you stink. Okay. They don't, she doesn't care for you. So remember, in conversation with your counselees, there are going to be times that a lot of information, sorry, that is shared that can be private, that can be one that they are confiding in you. And that's where the principle of confidentiality comes about. It is you are protecting private or secret information that is being disclosed in your relationship with them. 
Now that I think, especially as Christian leaders, we've got to be very, 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 very careful about because we are dealing with the lives of people. When someone comes in, now this, I don't think just, it's a, it's a principle we need to look at when we are uh, counselors, but even in our ministry, there may be many people who come to you to share something that's really personal. And they are doing that because they trust you, right? And the minute we may use that against them or uh, uh, use an example of that or over the pulpit or bring about it in some other context, maybe in a meeting, that is a breach of confidentiality. One of the core uh, um, um, standpoints of, of counseling is the principle of confidentiality. And that is, it is a right of the person who's coming to you because they're coming, uh, sharing that which is so personal as a, a counselor, that is a principle we need to stick by. It is an obligation. It is actually an ethical obligation of a counselor to do that. Okay, And only if we are able to uh, hold on to this principle does it become necessary for helping. People need to feel, um, uh, uh, feel safe, feel secure in the relationship. And in order for us to help them, in order to get more information, we have to ensure that there is this confidentiality that's there. Okay. Now, however, this right is not absolute. So what does this mean? Um, you're, uh, that, there are two things uh, that, that may, that, you know, especially when you're looking at in a more professional or a, you know, a setting where there is, there are a team of people working, um, the, the information can be shared with other professional people. Now, suppose like, for example, there is something that the, that the person is going through and, uh, you know, maybe I feel stuck here, so I need to discuss this with maybe another counselor to get more help. And that's something we tell the counselee that, you know, this will be discussed among a small group of professional people in order to help. Another time that it is not absolute is if there is any form of self-harm. You know, if you would see um, traces of uh, self-harm or uh, suicide, uh, attempts of suicide or harming oneself or harming somebody else, that's when confidentiality is not absolute because there is a risk of somebody else's life that is in, in, in question. And that's when we take the written permission of the individual to divulge some information to people that are necessary. It's not that we tell the whole world, it's telling the few people that are important in, in the help of the counseling. So these are the uh, seven uh, seven. Uh, uh, principles. I'll just uh, bring that once more before you. It's individualization, the purposeful expression of feelings, controlled emotional involvement, self-determination, acceptance, non-judgmental attitude, and the principle of confidentiality. Okay. Uh, we have, we're, we're almost done with, with two minutes before we close in prayer. Is there any question? I think there's a question here. I think I will just uh, deal, uh, look into that. If the counselee thinks that the counsellor is in approval of his action, will it not have a negative impact? Okay, so this really matters that, um, uh, like I said, I think your, your question comes from the standpoint, standpoint of if they are, talking about something, about their feelings. Remember, we are acknowledging their feeling, not their action. You're not acknowledging their action. You're not saying, hey, you're doing a right thing. Like, for example, the Su Susan we were talking about, right? So she's saying, I have second thoughts of my marriage. My response is not, oh, okay, you have second thoughts of your marriage. Okay, that's good. No, that's not my response. My response is, Susan, you seem extremely confused on what you need to do. You're, you, you feel a lot of chaos going inside of you, trying to make the right decision. I have not acknowledged her action or her desire. I've acknowledged her confusion. I've acknowledged the uncertainty that she's feeling or the frustration that she's feeling. Because once she's able to voice out those emotion, that emotional aspect of it, she will be in a better place to understand. Now, if I were to take every statement she makes as serious and say, okay, you can't have second thoughts of your marriage. You cannot um, you know, divorce your husband. 
I have jumped 20 steps ahead of her, right? Because I fear that she's going to do something. But if I can help to acknowledge that it is your emotions and your feelings that's making you think like this, maybe you need to settle down in your emotions, think a little bit more clearly after your calm down. I am walking in step with her. I'm walking in pace with her. So it is not an approval of her action. It is an approval of her emotion that I'm, I can see that you're uh, uh, distressed. I can see that you're confused. I can see that you are in a difficult position right now. Okay. I hope yes. I answered that question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I was just asking on in the context of the principle of acceptance, where you brought in an example of a husband, um, mm -hmm. like uh, having an extramarital affair in that okay. scenario, right? Um, uh, so if the counselee thinks that, okay, I'm approved, I'm I'm not saying anything against because probably everyone would have said negative about it, right? And when the counselor mm -hmm. is talking to that person, um, and he's not telling anything negative or positive mm -hmm. about it, so okay. so there is a chance that the person is thinking, oh, maybe it's nothing wrong. So right. so remember, Divya, the the conversation does not stop here, right? When, when we're having a conversation with you. So right now, what we're talking about is just acceptance. Now, so let's say in sessions, this is a question I may ask him. All right. Um, how, so what about, what do I want him to do? I want him to think. So once I've, I've acknowledged his feelings and wherever he's at as i the question i would ask him how do you think your current decision about this affair is either helping you or not helping you so what am i doing is making the person think i want him to think about his choices i want him to come to a place of thinking about what how is this extramarital helping me? How is it not helping me? I want to draw it out from him rather than giving, giving him a verdict of what I think is right or wrong. Okay. Or maybe my next question is, maybe let's say this person's a believer, right? As a believer, how do you see your stand or your choice helping you or not helping you? Now, my questions are going to help him to think. It's not going to either bring about a judgment or it's not going to bring about something that it's a right or wrong. That's not my position to do. My position is to bring him into a place of a realization, of learning to understand where he's at and thus making a choice. Because he can make a choice better if he realizes that he's in a mess, then he's going to make a better choice rather than all the people around him telling him, you know, this is not a good thing. And me adding in the same thing, saying, okay, this is not a good thing. I haven't said anything different. So why would he want to understand or take away anything from me? But rather, I want him to come to a place of realization and say, okay, you know, when I've thought about this, this is what is helpful. This is what is not helpful. Maybe I'll ask him, what do you think are the long-term effects of this arrangement you've made and i'm helping him think i'm helping him look at a way of how he needs to divide his problem better so that he can work through a solution and i will pick on certain things i will pick like maybe he will say you know maybe my wife will get to know so i'll say how do you think that's going to affect you and your future or your children or your family so that's what probing is. Now, in counseling, there's a whole lot of things that are needed, which is probing. Being able to probe in such a way that the individual begins to think and comes with a place of realization so that they can walk into a place of action. Okay, yeah. So helping them to see in a, through a different lens altogether. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's my right. job. That's my job. I'm not here as a moral uh, standard telling them this is right, this is wrong. What I want to do is, especially if they're believers, open their eyes to scripture. And what I do is, one of the word things that I ask is, how do you think what you're doing is in line with what scripture teaches you? Or what? how do you think you, you, you fall in alignment 
with what God wants you to do, right? And that that makes them think. And they'll say, yeah, maybe it is. Okay, so if, if you realize that, what change do you want to see in that? What do you want to do differently? And that's what I'm helping them to do rather than saying, OK, ABC, these are things you shouldn't do, this you shouldn't do, this you shouldn't do. Because it's not going to help. That's exactly what they're hearing from their family or they're hearing from a friend. But they need to come to a place of self-realization and understanding. So change is more internal than it is more externally driven. The change has to come from internal than being external. OK? Thank you. That helps. I hope yeah. that helps. OK. Yeah, thank you. Great. Good. If you all don't have any question, let's just pray and we can close. Any other question? OK. All right. I hope you will come back with some questions the next time. All right. I hope this was, uh, uh, I mean, I always love teaching counseling because it's so close to my heart. And I hope you really got some, you know, some truths in the way of how you can actually deal with people. This is not more about, um, you know, just about learning how to counsel, but even in the way that you deal with people. Uh, the, some of these principles are so beautiful that, you know, if we can inculcate them, you will be such a blessing to the Lord. Okay, Let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for each one of us on this call as well as on the e-learning uh, portal. Thank you, Father, that uh, you've given us years and a heart to understand. Father, thank you for the way that you've made every individual. Lord, even as you have called us into ministry, uh, such as helping people, we pray, Master God, that you will give us wisdom. You will give us the right understanding. Holy Spirit, we draw from you. You are, Lord, the Lord of every person, God. And you know exactly how you would want us to work with others. Give us, Lord, a glimpse and an understanding of it. We draw from your power. We draw from your strength. I bless every student here on this call. I thank you, Lord, for the places that they are in. I pray for great breakthroughs in their lives as the, as, as the next week follows. I pray, Father, that uh, you would bring about a shift in their understanding, in their in their life. Life, Lord, in, their, in the way that they see you, God, may it be in line with what your word says. Thank you for your goodness over our lives. Till we meet again, Father, we just pray that you, that you go ahead of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, just, just an announcement. We don't have class next Thursday. 26th is uh, not, uh, it's, it's going to be a holiday, so we will meet two weeks from now, and that is the um, uh, 2nd of February, okay? So 26, we do not have a class. Um, you, you, we look for, I look forward to meeting all of you all on the 2nd of February, all right? God bless, and thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.